Hello, uh, I'm Graham, and we're going to talk about user experience. So this track is about engagement and monetization and retention, those sorts of things that I'm sure you want for your game. And of course, user experience is a, is a vital component of that. But it's also a component that's been somehow, it's become nothing and everything at the same time. What is user experience? Just a quick show of hands, would anyone say they work in user experience or that's a part of your job? Don't be shy to admit it. OK, quite a few, actually. OK. So we'll try to understand the different types of user experience. And why this is so important to you is at some point as a studio, you need to hire someone who is doing the UX job, the user experience job. But it turns out they come in different flavors. And the, re the rationale behind this talk was because some studios were hiring the wrong people. They thought they were getting something, but they got something else. And that quite surprised them. They said, oh, but I thought user experience did whatever they thought. So that's the rationale behind the talk. It's to help developers understand, well, you want to make successful games. And yes, user experience is important to you. But it comes in different flavors, and you need to know which. OK, um, so my role out of interest, I'm a UX researcher or a user researcher. And by the end of the talk, you, hopefully you'll know what that means, or I've done a really bad job. So we'll see. I also got very confused. I even confused myself. The title of this talk originally said the seven UX roles. And then I argued with myself, no, 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 there's only six. And then I argued a bit more, no, 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 there's only five. I left it at six. And by the end of the talk, really? I think there's two. Sorry to, sorry to spoil it, you know, but uh, we can talk about that later. So a quick history of both game development and UX. Games start off with, started off arguably with a very simple interface. I was going to say no interface, but of course that's not true. Text is indeed an interface, it's text. Textual interfaces are completely fine. So that's where we started from in games with Zork. Anyone played Zork or any other text-based adventures? Oh, wow, okay. Showing your age perhaps, we'll see. Or, or retro fans. So then after that we had the early 8-bit days. Um, where we had things like the mighty Horace Goes Skiing uh, on your right-hand side. Uh, whoa, who, a shout-out for Horace Goes Skiing, I can't believe that. Okay, so I've been a bit um, unfair to Horace Goes Skiing because I've actually said the dev team who made it was programmers. Basically, I'm insinuating this is programmer art. Now, for all I know, they hired the UK's best artist to do Horace, or indeed the trees of the skiing. But I'm taking a guess at saying they didn't. Uh, and I'm taking a guess at saying the programmer probably did it. So we had these early games that did not need big teams because the displays available and what was needed could have been done by one person, the programmer. Move up a little bit, 16-bit days. Resolutions got a bit higher. Available memory got a bit, bit better, which means the things we were trying to put on screen could more closely resemble the objects from real life. Graphics got higher fidelity. During this stage, um, we did start to see specialist artists in UI roles. You had to. Programmers could no longer represent the things they wanted to represent in a way that people would enjoy, let's say. Some could, but, but some couldn't. Moving up again, the early 3D days, the PSX, the PlayStation 1, those sorts of era, 3D modeling became important. What we're saying is roles are getting more diverse. More people are needed to make these games. Let's fast forward a little bit. New devices came along, not just, not just um, graphics and higher fidelity, but new ways of interacting with a game. So not just the UI, but also the interaction, how you control that device. They also changed. Fast forward more recently, Assassin's Creed. It's alleged that 10 Ubisoft studios went into making um, Assassin's Creed Unity, I believe, uh, and around 1,000 developers. 1,000 developers, that's excluding marketing or anything, or publishing, anything else that was involved. Yeah. That's a very large development team. So over this development from the early Spectrum days or the 8-bit days all the way to today, more specific roles have emerged. And one of those roles is UX. But it's still not well understood. There were many UX roles used in Unity. And we're going to talk about the different styles and different types. So if we're going to get closer to describing UX, let's talk about maybe what it is not. Let's maybe start there. These are three very similar games. You will probably recognize the one in the top uh, left, which is Clash of Clans. And then there are many, 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 many clones that I could have chosen. I say clones, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, by the way. I'm just saying that they appear similar, and they have similar features. 
But even if someone were to make a Clash of Clans game and copy the, as the assets pixel for pixel, and if they copied the features, it is still possible for those games to have a different user experience. In other words, they feel different. Even though they look the same and they offer the same features, how those features are implemented can completely change the feel of the game, the behavior. Now, that's much closer to the user experience. It's about how you feel. So it is possible to, to allegedly clone a game as close as you think. But you could make that game worse. Or you could make it better. So this is what we're trying to mean by user experience. But let's take a step back again. The very origins of user experience actually came from fields called human factors or ergonomics. This is way before computers. So what we're saying is anybody who had to interact with a machine or operate in an environment, if you wanted to make that environment safe and pleasurable to use, then an ergonomist or someone with a human factors background, that was their job to understand. So it's predominantly the background of psychologists. They understood how people use their environment. More recently, that field may be called human-computer interaction. So if you're talking specifically about digital interfaces, then it's the job of the human-computer interaction specialist to say, I understand how people work with digital displays. And all the early work at Xerox Park and things like that, the Star, the early Mac, all that sort of thing, they were done by people who worked in human-computer interaction. But it's not enough, because what those guys were really interested in at the very beginning of the field was about usability. In other words, can the person do what I want them to do? And even in the web, and uh, if, you're, if you're a web developer, usability is more common than UX. Even though they say UX, that's a long discussion, I know. But what they're really interested in is, can you do the thing you want to do? Can you buy the book? Can you book the flight? Can you book the hotel? Can you do that in a way that you expect without error? That's the field of usability. And that's where these guys came from. But that doesn't quite cut it for video games. Just because you can do it does not mean that you enjoy it, right? So let's look at that initial field to see why it's so important to game development today before we move on. This is anyone who's done any design lessons. This is the very most basic lesson in, in design of anything. On the top left, you understand people. What do you want to do? You move across to design. OK, people want to do this. Here's how we're going to design the thing for that person. You move down to implementation. OK, we'll make the thing. We evaluate the thing. Did we build it right? If we did not build it right, we go back and redesign it based on the evidence. We go around as many times as necessary until we do get it right, and then we ship it. Any design textbook will have this diagram or some variation of this diagram in it somewhere. And you'll cover it in the first, first year of undergraduate school in design. From industrial design to computer design to game design, it doesn't matter. You've probably seen something like this. So those early guys, the human factor psychologists or human computer interaction, what they were concerned with were these three main areas. Their job was to understand people. What do you want to do? They would then help the designer. Are you designing it correctly based on what information the people can understand? They wouldn't do the implementation. But they would very much heavily focus on the evaluation. Did you do it right? So that was their job. Fair enough. We all understand that. But this is usability. We're still not getting to user experience. But we're nearly there. So what we're saying is UX is somehow linked to usability. This is the guy who made the term UX. So Don Norman is one half of the Nielsen Norman group. So you Don Norman, a psychologist, and you Jakob Nielsen, a computer scientist, a Danish computer scientist. And together, they formed a group that do usability and user experience. And this is his definition. I'll just read this out briefly. I invented the term because I thought human interface and usability were too narrow. I wanted to cover all aspects of the person's experience with the system blah, 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 including all these things. This is the most important part. Since then, the term has spread widely, so much so that it's starting to lose its meaning. And that's the whole point of this talk. People are saying, I do UX. The truth is, they, they're probably not doing UX. Bits of it could be true, but it's not what he was talking about. So this is the guy who made the term saying, yeah, I coined that term. But honestly, it's now so widely used that it's lost its meaning. So this is an attempt to bring it back. And also to help you as game developers, you have to hire someone and find someone in your studio. And you need to find the right person. But if this term is so wide encompassing, then how do you know what you're looking for? So I'm going to go through six types, 
very, very quickly of the different types of person you could potentially hire. The first one is the origins of the field. Uh, they're called user researcher or UX research, and that's the background that I have. My job is to answer why. Why does someone like your game? Why do they not understand your game? Why did they leave? Anything to do with retention, engagement, all those sorts of why questions, that's what a user researcher does. Why would you need them? Well, they understand people. Uh, they understand the structure of interfaces, not painting it, we'll come to that later. Uh, and they assess gameplay. How did you feel when playing that game? What were the barriers in the way? All that sort of stuff. Brief types of background from the people in Sony or Microsoft or even us or Ubisoft. They typically have a master's or PhD either in human computer interaction or human factor psychology. That's the most common type of background. So if someone says they're a UX researcher, that's what you should expect from that role. So here's our graph we're building up. UX, so far, what have we found? One of them is user research. And down the right hand side, these are sort of skills you would expect. What's next? An information architect. Perhaps slightly less common, more common in the web actually. But if you're making a game that's got heavily, heavily menu driven, and lots of textual information, and lots of potential uh, graphical heavy, I guess, in terms of menu structure, then an information architect is maybe what you need. What do they do? Well, they, they're concerned with the structure of information uh, and findability. I need to find this menu option. Why is it over there? Why on earth did they put it there? It makes no sense. Right, that's because no one from information architecture background helped you structure your, uh, the menus. Their background typically, at least in the web world, would come from information science or library science. In gaming, it's not really a specific role, I have to say, but I have seen it mentioned in job ads, so I had to cover it. This is the sort of thing they do. So if your game has lots of menus in lots of different areas, the information architect will help you structure that information based on people. So they don't make it up, it's not manufactured, they go and interview people or follow people in their job role to see what they do, and then they structure this in a way that makes complete sense. So that when you use the system or use the game, it goes, of course it's there, where else would it be? This is a slow example from World of Tanks, but it could come from any game where there's lots of menus and it's quite, quite a lot of information. So we're up to two areas, and I'm running out of time, so I better speed up. The third one's UX designer, very common indeed. Um, and oddly enough, their job is design the user experience. Now this is completely different from game design. They work with the game designer, but they're meant to take all the information, somehow prototype it and mock it up so that they could hand that information to the, the programmer. You'll see examples in a second. So they're meant to understand people, uh, but that could have come from a user researcher. They often work independently. They mock up what the screens may look like and then hire that, follow that to the programmer. Their background's kind of mixed. I've met people who are furniture designers who do user experience and all sorts of weird jobs. Uh, not that furniture design's a weird job, I should retract that immediately. Uh, it's a perfectly fine job. What I'm saying is it's not uh, a background that you may expect. These are the sorts of things they do. You've probably seen this sort of stuff before. So here's what our screens may look like. The idea why you need them is because you want to make your mistakes on paper before you give it to the programmer or the visual artist because that's really expensive. If you can catch an issue here, that's much better. And it's important to say that you're meant to test these things with real people. If you're, well, we'll come to that at the end. Come to that at the end. So we've added our third role. On the number four, an interaction designer. Interaction is about the interface. Uh, I'm going to go very quickly because I've got a video to show you which explains it much better. You've probably all seen the film Minority Report, where Tom Cruise tries to use this futuristic system. This was done by an interaction designer, so their job is to come up with new interfaces. And their job is especially true whenever new systems come out, like Kinect and things like that. Their job is to imagine what would a new system interact like. By the way, in most things in the movies, those interfaces do not work. They're mocked up, they're, they're just for show. In this case, that's not true. This is a genuine system built by Jeff Han. Uh, his company is called Perceptive Pixel. And apparently, this is a working system. It is not mocked up or Hollywood veneer, if you like. This is the real deal. You get the idea. You've seen it before, I'm sure. So this is the realm of the interaction designer. I'm running out of time, so I have to go very quickly. The last one's a UX developer. Their job is mostly concerned with programming, so taking that, those details and implementing, implementing them. So make it work, basically. Um, and finally, we have the UI artist. So the UI artist or visual treatment is the person who, who paints the screen, if you like. They make this happen. But they're not necessarily to do with the structure of the information of where it is or to do with the copy. Their job is on the visual presentation. 
So whenever I scour UX jobs, all these six, six different types have, have come up, but they're used interchangeably. It says I'm out of time. I'm, I'm into the questions area. So although there are six types, I can boil it down to four quite easily. Um, because things like development, UX development, maybe your programmer could do that. And if I was being a bit harsh, I could boil it down to three types that would either help you the most. You probably need, a, for your studio, you may need a user researcher to help you understand games, a UX designer to help you do the mock-ups to present to the programmer, and then you need someone, maybe a visual artist. But the most common role, which is not necessarily true, is that of UI UX. And this is the one that some people have tried to actually say, stop saying UI UX, it doesn't make any sense. There's even a website called UX is not UI. It's become such a problem. This is what UI does on the right-hand side, effectively, and on the left is what UX. And they're just trying to say, as developers, what do you want? Do you want someone to paint the screen and do UI? Or do you want someone to help you understand your game and the structure of the information? It is true that some UI people will do elements of UX, but there's a quote from the NN group, the people who invented this term, and they said, if you're not involving users, then that's not UX. That's called design, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's fine, but just call it what it is. And I'm done. I'm getting bad looks, so I have to go. <laughs>